Hey, Lily, are we ready to go in the woods or in the red brush? Huh? Are you ready to go? Yeah, we don't have to ask you twice, do we? All right, let's go. Hey, everyone. Clint here with Lily. And today we're going to talk about dogwood being the underdog of the bow hunting world, pun intended. You know, when it comes to public land, I think dogwood is the most overlooked spot for bow hunters. And rightfully so. Uh, you know, if you look behind me, I'm in this big dogwood patch and there's really not much to set up in except that guy right there, possibly. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you how I break down these dogwood patches, why they're such a great, great spot to hunt, bow hunt for public land bow hunting and how to hunt them and how to look them and not overlook them when it comes to your bow hunting strategy uh, for this fall. All right, so let's go over that right now. First off, let's talk about the difference between uh, dogwoods, okay? Now, primarily here in Wisconsin, we have two forms of dogwood. We have the silk dogwood or the gray dogwood, as it's sometimes called, silk gray dogwood, same. And then we have the red, which is called the red OCR dogwood, all right? And also known as red brush. I used to call it red brush for many years. But one of the things that I've noticed from a dogwood perspective, this is just from my own observation, um, is that dogwood, first of all, makes great brows, uh, especially for the doe families. And when it comes to either red or the gray silk, I tend to find more of the browsing done on the red. Now, this is actually kind of a unique um, dogwood swamp that I'm in right now because it has the combination of the red and the silk. So uh, I've always liked hunting dogwood. Um, but a few years ago, I was kind of stuck into a predicament uh, by necessity. Um, I went to go hunt central Wisconsin with a buddy of mine. And it was a new area that we hunted, or essentially I hunted. He's been out there for quite a few years. And I was hunting public land. And just like everybody else, I was scouting on my maps and looking at these so-called great spots. And what I found out is that all these spots that I thought was great from a mapping perspective was also great to everyone else. And matter of fact, I remember going out to the first spot early in the morning, uh, hour and a half before dark, getting into my stand, hit my headlamp on the trees, and I must have saw about 40 to 50 tacks in all different directions light up. And I'm like, oh boy, this isn't good. And, you know, I went back there and I think I saw maybe a, a doe family and, and that was it. And they were pretty skittish because they knew of all the hunting pressure that was going on. So I had to change tactics. And one of the things driving through this big public land marsh area, if you want to call it that, I started noticing something. I started noticing a lot of deer, just doe families, going through these red brush areas or dogwood areas from one end to the other. And you know what? I started putting two and two together and I'm like, I need to be in that dogwood. And two days later, I made the, the move to get into the dogwood. And I'll tell you one thing, I saw deer and bucks big time, um, but it was kind of unique on how these bucks utilize this dogwood. And then ever since then, uh, I started putting game plans together in hunting these public land dogwoods. So what I really started to notice when I hunt in these dogwood thickets is what happens is it's usually the prime time is right at that late pre-rut uh, time frame. And these does are not in heat yet and they don't really want to be harassed by these bucks. And what they can do is they can get into these dogwood thickets like you see behind me. And this particular one is extremely thick, okay? Uh, it's actually pretty tough even for myself just to barely you know, walk through. And what they're doing is they're, they're getting away from bucks. They have the food source. Usually they're towards the edge and they're heading and hitting these, let's say public or even private land food sources uh, in the evenings. But they're a way to get away from these big bucks. And what I noticed is right during that late pre-rut time frame, right before does go into heat, it's like the perfect time to hit these dogwood thickets. Because these bucks come in here and they're harassing these does and the does are using the thick cover here to get away from them. And you'll see them. I mean, it'll be like mice coming out of a wheat bag. They'll be flying all over. And usually what you'll notice is, this is almost verbatim, 
you'll see the dough being pushed, usually by at least one buck, obviously. Uh, I've seen them being pushed by four or five bucks at a time on public land. And then you'll see the two fawns trailing way behind. And these does basically just stay within uh, these dogwood thickets. They actually do not head up onto the high ground where you see a lot of bull hunters. Um, and I don't think it's because does, yes or no, maybe it's because they know the bull hunters are up there. But what they're trying to do, is they're trying to get away from these big bucks, pushing them around in these dogwood thickets. And they can lose them uh, much easier from that perspective. And they also, they have the cover and they have the browsing food source. So from my perspective, from what I've witnessed over the years in regards to hunting these dogwood thickets, okay, is that does want to lose big bucks and it's perfect timing right around that late pre-rut stage, all right, right before does go into heat. So how do we hunt these dogwood thickets? Well, you know, the advantage already goes to the deer because right where I'm standing, a lot of this is water uh, come late October and deer even the mature does can hear you coming from a ways away. The other thing is most of these dogwood thickets have the advantage of sight. So these does uh, like to set up and mature bucks like to set up right on the edges where I'm at right now. And if you look behind me, they can see me coming from a long ways away. All right. So they have that going for them. That makes it a little tougher. And then the hardest part for the bull hunter, you know, is getting a spot to sit in. And you know, right where I'm at right now, okay, uh, if I put myself in here, I have just very little shooting range. I'm easily spotted because I'm this, you know, big block, uh, blob technically sticking out, all right? So what I tend to look for are these little lone trees, okay? Now, in Wisconsin here, we have to be a little careful. We've had the emerald ash borer come through, and a lot of these are dead. So we have to be very careful in choosing the right tree. I do not recommend sitting in an ash tree. That can make it a little bit tougher because the ash here in Wisconsin, at least, they like to settle in these um, dogwood thickets, all right? But, okay, this particular tree behind me is actually a pretty good spot to set up in, all right? So let's take a look uh, why that is and how I would set up in this particular tree here. All right, well, I made quite a bit of noise just walking 30 yards just to get to this particular tree, but here is that dead tree behind me, okay? And one of the things I really like about this particular spot, besides the tree being dead, that I'm not a fan of, but is if you look over, I'm kind of literally kind of like in a little bit of a, like a funnel pinch almost. It's actually kind of a unique spot because I have a little opening there. And then I have this little opening over there and you can't quite see it, but this is where I came from was right over here, okay? And so if I even got up into that tree, and I wouldn't even need to get very high, um, I probably need to get about seven to eight feet uh, from the ground um, on that tree there. And I would be able to shoot 30 yards over the top of this particular red brush. And here's the other little unique thing. It's right next to this tree. It's just a small little rub, um, probably made by a, a smaller buck. Um, so they can come in here and, uh, or they're, they are coming in here and going through this particular area. And once again, you know, these bucks are going to stay on this edge looking for these does. And then what they're going to do is they're, once they get on to them, uh, even though they're not ready to be bred yet, the does, they're going to harass them. They're going to start pushing them around. And this is a great spot once again to be. So if I'm looking for this particular spot, I'm probably Halloween weekend. Matter of fact, if not, even a little bit before that, maybe the weekend before Halloween here in Wisconsin, uh, we're at that stage where those does are not ready to be bred yet. And these bucks are going to be coming in here and they're going to be pushing them around. You know, all it takes is a buck to make a mistake. Matter of fact, a lot of the times when I've seen bucks do this, um, it's kind of entertaining and heart pumping at the same time because you'll see these bucks just flying around in here and you're like, oh man, how, what, what can I do? Um, key first of all i just want to point out do not grunt at them all right uh because if you grunt at them while they're pushing does around they are going to push that doe away from you so fast it ain't even funny all right so put that grunt call away if bucks are coming through you're pushing does around now on the other hand if you have a lone buck just coming through 
on one of these edges, okay, that's a different story. Um, you can hit them with the grunt call a little bit and see what the reaction is. And matter of fact, I wait for them to go past me first because in these public land areas, these bucks are so used to rattling and grunt calls, uh, they already might know what's up with a grunt call. So if anything, the grunt call is the last resort. Um, when a buck, let's say, in this case comes through, doesn't quite give me the shot I'm looking for, all right? But if that buck is pushing those does, okay, through here, do not use that grunt call. Um, I'll tell you right now, he will push those does away from you. In regards to these dogwood thickets, another thing you want to consider when setting up uh, in these thickets, okay, is do you want to be on the edge or do you want to be in the middle or do you want to be on the opposite edge? And once again, that is going to be determined by the property itself and essentially what I like to call the public use of that particular property. So for instance, if it is an area where pheasant hunters um, hunt, okay, and their dogs are pushing those edges all the time, and most pheasant hunters, they don't usually go in very far. And I've sat on these public land spots uh, when these pheasant hunters come through. For instance, they'll just kind of push these edges right here but they don't tend to go in here. And it's actually kind of funny when I get deeper into these dogwood thickets on public land that have pheasants, a lot of those birds are way in deep. And if some of these guys would just go in further with their dogs, uh, they could kick them up. But that's an advantage to me as a bow hunter. So what I then tend to focus on is the edge, okay? I'm not going so much in the middle. What I'm doing then is I will try to find access to that back side or essentially the opposite edge of these dogwood thickets, okay? A lot of these does are gonna be on these edges, all right, once again, so they can see. Because if they're in the middle, uh, they may be able to smell what's coming from one direction, but they're not gonna be able to see what's coming from the direction that they can't smell from, okay? So that's why you always wanna be on one of these two edges. Once again, if it's the edge that have the pheasant hunters, okay? You're gonna wanna be on that opposite edge of that dogwood thicket. And then the other thing you're going to have to consider is the wind and how the wind is going to play uh, the part of that. So I want to be on the outside edge and essentially having my wind blow across the field. I don't want my wind blowing in to the dogwood thicket. Now let's assume that you do not um, have pheasant hunters, okay? Or maybe this is a private piece that you're hunting. Or let's say it's public big woods, because I do have some dogwood thickets in some of the public north woods that I hunt. And in that case, if there is a food source on the outside edge, all right, that's where you want to be. You want to be closest to that food source, okay? Because what these does are doing is they're setting here up on the edges, and then they're going to be moving from there out to the food source, okay? The other thing is, is a lot of these dogwood thickets will run in a lengthwise direction, okay? Not too many are essentially square. Uh, they run more lengthwise, and what these bucks like to do, they like to travel the length component to it, okay? And then the does are just going the short direction or the width direction, if you want to call it that, okay? So consider that as well. But yes, if you do not have a lot of pressure on one side, uh, public land pressure, pheasant hunters, even bull hunters, the side that's closest to the food source is where you want to set up. So if you look behind me, I'm actually in a little bitty pond right here that froze over right in the middle of this dogwood thicket. And the reason I bring this up is that if you get a cold late October or early November that creates that water to freeze a little bit, obviously, um, and it's not hard enough to hold deer up, the deer will avoid it. And it's for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's extremely noisy for deer. They know that every predator in the area can hear them basically breaking through ice. The other thing, it slows them down um, if they're trying to get away from a predator, which they understand. And I think the biggest component is that you get to that point where that it's just um, breaks through for deer, but it's strong enough to hold, let's say, a wolf or coyote up. Uh, they're done, um, you know, because the deer are going to struggle to get through, let's say, a dogwood thicket that's essentially semi-ice covered. And the coyotes, the wolves, the predators uh, can stay on their trail and basically just bring them right down. So, with that understanding, if you get that ice in these dogwood thickets that are not thick enough to hold up a full-size deer, you will not see deer, for the most part, in these dogwood thickets, all right? You'll see them right before it ices up, and then you'll see them again when the ice is strong enough to hold 
them up completely um, and then they can go on their way through here all right so keep that in mind uh, if you hunt in the northern states and you're watching this that ice has to be strong enough to hold up a full-size deer otherwise you will not see them in these areas so you're scouting your dogwood thicket and you know what you're you're trying to find your spots to set up one thing I really want to mention too uh, or talk about is finding those great big trees especially those big willows now, I don't know if you can see it, but over the top here, basically on the back side of this dogwood thicket, there's a big old tree over there. And in order for that big old tree to stand up or hold up, um, it needs higher ground or a little higher ground than, than is being wet. It can be where the big bucks actually bed, all right? So don't overlook these particular spots where these bucks can bed. And I made a video a while back called Sentinel Buck Beds. And essentially what that means these are buck beds where bucks will actually sit, especially in high pressured areas, and they'll wait for does to come to them, okay? Um, especially your really mature white tails. Um, so you can check that video out uh, on my YouTube channel on sentinel buck beds. But finding something like that, you have to keep in mind, and if you can get close enough to it, especially if it's in, let's say, a pinch or a funnel area, um, that, is, that is key, okay? One thing I want to mention too about these dogwood thickets and the reason I like them as well is nobody comes in here and messes with trail cameras because there's really no spot to put them. And even if you found a tree to put them on like I did earlier, that tree obviously you can be utilized for bow hunting out of, but it really does you no good putting a trail camera there, you know, with only let's say five to 10 feet uh, to be able to uh, film a deer or capture a picture of a deer walking by, all right? So these are usually void of humans all year long just from that standpoint because nobody comes in here and messes with trail cameras for the most part. What you're looking for then is not only those edges, but where they funnel a little bit, especially if they create like a funnel towards the edge. You want to find that one tree that you can get up in uh, and you don't have to get very high. In some cases, you might be only getting four or five feet up off the ground. Uh, either way, whether you go up two feet off the ground uh, or 20 feet off the ground, please always remember to wear that safety harness. You never know what can happen uh, in the woods, all right? And then the other thing is to look for those bigger trees, okay, where there could be possibly be a buck bed. Um, if you're scouting it during this off season, go check it out. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I'm gonna try to get over there and check out that big tree. I'm assuming that I can make it through this brush. It's pretty thick. And then the trails, you might find some trails uh, in some of those dogwood thickets, you may not. I wouldn't focus too many, too much on the trails, uh, so to speak. Like I said, these dogs are gonna be trying to lose these bucks. And a lot of times they're not gonna be on the trails. They're just gonna try to run around. The bucks may stay on the trail a bit. They may come off. The key I'm looking for is somewhere where the dogwood pinches or funnels just a little bit, and enough where you can catch some of these outer edges along that dogwood funnel, all right? So you're ready to dive into the dogwood thickets after watching this video, and I don't blame you. Now, what do they look like on a map? So you're gonna decide that you wanna hunt more of these, and let's say you don't live near the area that you plan on hunting and you wanna cyber scout it. They can be a little bit harder to see uh, on camera or essentially on aerial photos. Now, the red dogwood uh, can pop out sometimes a little bit easier um, but it's this gray dogwood or silk dogwood that have the majority of me behind me here that's a little tougher to see. And usually it's just a little bit more patchy. You can see those openings within that dogwood, which makes it kind of easy in some ways when you're cyber scouting to be able to, to focus on some spots like I was talking about those funnels towards those edges, all right? Um, but you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna post some pictures right now from a cyber scouting perspective of areas that I know that are dogwood and you can see those right now. So hopefully that gives you uh, kind of an idea or perspective of what dogwood looks like uh, from aerial uh, component. But 
you have to put boots on the ground. You can't just cyber scout and walk right in because you have to find these essentially lone trees to sit in, all right? Uh, wherever they might be, what I like to look for. You know, and if that's not a possibility, let's just say you have a dog with thicket that does not have any trees to sit in, or let's just say they're dead ash, they're not safe to sit in, okay? Then the next best thing to do is to find an area that might have a trail. I'm actually on one of these trails right here. I can, I think you can see it right here, okay? And if you look behind me, I have these little spots that come out and they actually poke out just a little bit. Um, and what you're gonna try to do is you're just gonna try to get yourself tucked into one of these spots and be able to try to catch a deer coming through here, all right? Um, I prefer to be in a tree and that's why these dogwood thickets uh, are so good because it's hard for most bull hunters to get into a particular tree, especially with climbers. Um, because climbers don't usually work on these particular trees that have a lot of branches sticking off of them. Uh, that's where the saddle and a hang-on stand comes in handy. But if you don't have those trees to sit from, um, just make the best of it that you can and look at your backdrop. Your backdrop uh, should be thicker or darker because if it's not, you are gonna stick out like a sore thumb uh, to deer. And you know, they're just used to looking out in front of them, off to the sides and behind. Uh, so it's gonna be a little extra that you're gonna have to do, but that's just the way it is. You gotta make it happen. These dogwood thickets, for myself at least, are a gem when it comes to these public land spots, especially highly pressured spots. If I'm going to anywhere in Wisconsin that's highly pressured, the first place I'm looking are these dogwood thickets. Um, like I said, people just avoid them. They can't walk in them usually if the water's high. No cell cameras usually, um, or trail cameras in general. And they're just a great place to set up. One thing I just want to mention though, is when it comes to these dogwood thickets, bigger is better, okay, in this particular case. Uh, if they're small, that's fine. Um, just as long as you can't see through them. You want to make sure that you can't really see through them so that we deer can really hide. And they just have to be those areas that people just don't go, especially the pheasant hunters, if you're in an area that has a lot of pheasant hunters uh, on public land, all right? So if you folks enjoy this video, please hit that subscribe button. And that's telling me that these are the videos that you want to see. And the more subscribers that I have in regards to these videos, the more I will make of these particular videos, all right? So I'm gonna give it a call it a day here with Miss Lily. I don't think Lily's ready to call it a day. Lily could go all day. Um, I'm gonna check out one more spot here on the walk back and then go from there. All right, folks, until next time, Clint and Lily from Okanagan Iron Outdoors.